Okay, welcome to February's Midwestern University Physical Therapy Institute live stream. Happy to have you all joining us. I will pass it on to Tom here in a second. But I want to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Mark Cardula. I'm a physical therapist, a clinical assistant professor here at Midwestern University in our Glendale location. Been a physical therapist for 20 years and have the good fortune of getting to treat our patients here at Midwestern University, but also get to teach our fine students as well. Um, Tom, why don't you introduce yourself, sir? Hi, Mark. Uh, my name is Tom Dillon. Uh, similar uh, role here. I'm on our Donos Grove campus. Been a PT for about 15 years, specialized in orthopedics. Um, here at the clinic, we do some teaching, we do a lot of treating, and we do some uh, clinical research. So glad to be here. Yes, another month we're back at it. And this month we're talking about chronic pain. It's a topic that is a passion topic of mine. That's one of my favorite things to study to do a little bit of limited research with and um, mainly try to work with patients um, who are dealing with it. It's a big problem in our country. The statistics around the world show that chronic pain is only getting worse yet with all the amazing technology and things you would think it'd be going the other direction. We'll hopefully touch upon why that might be today of why despite all our advances in healthcare and things that we're still kind of struggling with the chronic pain uh, epidemic in the world. Um, Tom, why don't we get into some of the discussion of what is it? What does chronic pain mean? Because there's there's a lot of different definitions out there, and you'll hear different things you know talked about when it comes to chronic pain. But what do you? What is chronic pain? Yeah, I mean, with any sort of medical definition that tries to encompass such a grand thing, you're going to run into to either overlap or inconsistencies. But there's some commonalities that I think will help people understand what we're referring to here. I mean, if you really want to break it down, we have chronic pain versus acute pain. We all can be familiar with acute pain. You stub your toe, you know the mechanism of what's causing those symptoms, and uh, it, it goes away within the expected time frame. You know, within minutes of moving around, your toe doesn't hurt anymore. That's expected. What we're finding, though, with chronic pain is that the pain and the symptoms tend to last longer than our expectations. And this could be sort of a, a, a due to a, a, a very particular mechanism, we, that's something we can know. Like we, we know maybe someone dealing with cancer and those treatments can have persistent pain for a very long time. They fall into a category of chronic pain, but there's a mechanism. But then you have a category of people where it's hard to identify the mechanism and they're still having this pain that's persisting. A lot of uh, definitions will also talk about it as pain that lasts longer than three months. That tends to be where a lot of people fall. Uh, I've seen other reports of six months. Again, there's a little inconsistency, but what I, I think that most people would, would understand here is that the pain is lasting longer than you expect and longer than what normal healing times should be. Um, but chronic pain, I mean, it, it is a huge problem, as you said. I mean, it's by the, by the World Health Organization, it's considered a public health priority. Um, and it just consumes a ton of resources, both from healthcare and time and social resources, and its impact is pretty large. Um, and it's touched on by a lot of different health professions. So it is something that we're all very aware of uh, and have our hand in. So it's a, it's a big deal lately. Yeah. And I think one thing to touch upon, too, because there's this belief and sometimes can be correct, because definitely, as Tom alluded to, there are times where we have fractures, we stub toes and different things. But after three months, and if we look at what tissue healing, you know, literature and what the, what we know about how tissues heal, usually six to eight weeks, some maybe a little bit more, nerves can be a little bit more maybe, but usually things heal, yet pain can persist. And it becomes much more complex than simply what your tissues um, say on an x-ray, what it looks like on an MRI. Although that's traditionally with a more biomedical look at it, which again, biomedical is not wrong. It's just when it really tries to look at this very linear pattern of, I have this pain, I'm going to identify this specific thing on a film, it's going to get identified, it's going to get treated specifically, and it's going to get fixed. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the patients we see with persistent pain have been through a litany of different treatments and different professions, PTs, physical therapists, uh, chiropractors, osteopaths, um, every ologist, uh, specialty physician under the sun, yet still struggling with pain. So we wanted to touch a little bit upon, you know, the difference of why tissues aren't always the problem yet again they get labeled as, as such this is a study that i think is, is very helpful it was done in 2015 and there was like i believe over 2000 people and they just looked at well what do our spines look like as we age and these are all people who have zero pain in their spine at the moment they are just pain-free asymptomatic subjects and as you can see here 
The top line is disdegeneration, which I hate that word or the term just because it makes us seem like our aging process is this degenerative uh, process. And I always joke with my patients. I say, calling that degenerative disc disease is like calling my head this degenerative scalp disease. I mean, I've come to terms with it. I'm okay with it. I've, I'm, you know, it's just a normal part of it. It's just another saying I've heard about aging is like, we don't pathologize the wrinkles on our skin, yet the wrinkles on the inside are disc changes and things we really pathologize and have all sorts of fearful things around it. But you can see and this first uh, area is 20 years old, 37% of people have degenerative disc changes. As we get older, 30s, we go up to, you know, when you're at age 50, 90% of us have degenerative disc bindings on a film. Um, the, the gray line, disc bulges, that's a common one that gets very fearful, fear-inducing literature around it, fear-inducing things around it, on the internet especially. Yet at age 20, one in three of us have one. Um, and these are all without pain. Um, and, and we're not saying that some of these findings when we initially herniate a disc or have problems can become a sensitive issue. But it, the good thing we know about this, and, and these over 2,000 people have shown, you can have these findings on film and it's not have pain. And some of the arguments around this is that the, the simple getting this label and people really limiting their life and starting to move with a lot of fear and protection is a lot of the root of why sometimes this chronic pain and persistent pain issue kind of pervades a lot of folks and, and sticks around beyond what would heal after a acute disc bulge or any of that. But you can look at facet degeneration um, and other things too, that just as we age, our body shows aging. Um, and, and Tom had already alluded to, you know, it being more complex than tissues and that we had to look more at more at other things. This is a slide from a recent study that I, I just pulled off um, that I just came up through a colleague, but it, it looked at different environmental factors affecting chronic pain because there's the pain that we get taught in school, which is like the nerve, fiber from the tissue you stub your toe on, travels to the spinal cord in the brain, and you have an experience of pain. Yet we see people that there aren't many messages coming from tissues, yet they have a lot of other things influencing other parts of their nervous system, um, significant stress and distress. But a lot of people who've been in persistent pain can speak to a lot of the things that give them every reason to be depressed, angry, frustrated, when they're not able to, to perform the activities, they're not able to they perform the roles they define themselves on in life. They've lost their ability to work. They've lost their ability to financially support themselves the way we want to. We could probably list thing after thing that can kind of contribute to that stress systems. And when our nervous system puts us in more of a distressed state, I always give people the analogy of the shift of like your body when it's in the beach at sunset in the most relaxing environment, our physiology where our blood pressure's down, our heart rate's down, our muscle tension is minimal. Our body feels usually pretty good when we're in those contexts, but when we're in like a haunted house, the opposite of that, muscle tension, heart rate, blood pressure, all these real physiologic changes can be the same exact person, but that's where the context that's happening around pain as we experience it in life can be very dictating on how much that pain has a chance to just go back and fade into the background or can persist with people. So this talks about smoking, air pollution, weather and temperature changes. Um, I know folks over up in Chicago probably dealing with a little bit <clears throat> more challenges. Hey, it's warm today, Mark. It's warm today. Hey, you guys are hopefully busting out of the freezing marks <laughs> yeah, here in Arizona. We're we're in the 70s, so can't complain. Viral infections. We're seeing a lot of uh, you know influx of persistent pain issues with COVID, post-viral syndromes, and things. Um, we're we're seeing some challenging uh, situations with patients dealing with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sleep disturbances. Social interaction, which is something we don't think about. How does that influence pain? There's just a lot when, when pain isolates you and you're not in your social circles at work or with family and friends, um, it really starts turning on you know, pathways within the brain and influencing pathways in the brain that can really influence the pain experience. Um, we've talked about stress and some of the other environmental factors with it. Um, so yeah, it is more than tissues it's it's quite complex um tom what are your, what has been your experience with some of the complexity you see in in pain patients and in pain in general yeah and i think that's one of the bigger challenges we have as clinicians where we're, we're a really big part of conservative care right we we don't really utilize the medications we don't prescribe medications we, we focus on you know what physical therapists focus on movement and and that sort of thing but a lot of what we focus on in this population is education and i think really trying to show the individual uh, what these influences are and, and how pain is affecting them. Um, one, one good way that you were describing pain uh, and nociception, I know that's a, that's a $5 word there, but um, they are separate. And I think that um, what we get too caught up on is that, like you said, it's the, 
this the nerve sending a painful response. Um, but what you demonstrated there is that the influence to that experience of now a larger system of pain comes from a thousand different factors. And so maybe some of our role is to take that complexity and break it down for people in sort of bite-sized ways, manageable ways, things that small changes can occur, uh, lifestyle changes or uh, exercise habit changes, um, you know, things like that. So yes, I think um, the complexity is, is a big part of it. And I think education goes a long way when I'm face to face with a patient. Um, and, and learning this through pain education, what, uh, what are the other names for it? Pain neuroscience education, you know, they can get complex with it. But a lot of that can be delivered from lifestyle medicine physicians. It can be delivered from uh, PMNR physicians, physical therapists. We all have a, a good amount of knowledge that can help guide someone through this. Um, I also like what you were, when you were mentioning um, the influences of all these different uh, factors, kind of really demonstrating uh, the two different approaches to something like pain, a biomedical approach versus a biopsychosocial approach. And, and what those two categories mean is that there's a, a medical approach to pain and management of pain that involves trying to change the mechanism that's causing it through medication or, uh, or some sort of medical intervention versus um, the other model, which tries to take into account this idea of education, learning about it, modifying your lifestyle, implementing a lot of things involving your psychosocial part of your life uh, in order to help understand and, and uh, manage that pain a little better. Um, so yeah, very complex. And I think step one for a lot of people dealing with this complex chronic pain is to learn about it and, and, and find yourself someone that can educate you about it uh, in a helpful way. Yeah. And I just to kind of piggyback off what you said there, Tom, because I definitely agree. I think, you know, biomedical approaches really focus on finding the cause, the one factor. And sometimes that works. Like I said, you have a fracture on an x-ray, man, you find it, you put a, put a brace on it, cast it maybe for a little bit. And, and all's well, you did, things heal. But chronic pain, as that slide before talked about, very significant factors that can, can, can drive it. And it can be much more than just the message from your tissue. That message from your tissue has to navigate into a spinal cord and a brain is, that's in the context of your life. Again, our, is our life through this pain really becoming limited? Are we getting pulled away from our social world? Are we getting depressed, frustrated, understandably, with some of the struggles that pain can bring into our life? And oftentimes, that as pain transitions from acute to chronic, it's those mechanisms that keep our stress systems so active and sensitive, sensitized that it really can drive pain without much needing to come from the peripheral uh, tissues. So uh, it is one of those things that if you can start learning, as Tom mentioned, about all the factors and some of the big transitions and things we'll see with patients is if they're a lot of what we people we see have been through list upon list of pain physicians and different folks, all great people with great intentions, but a lot of times with the I need my pain fixed before I can move forward approach. It really can start limiting people and really gets them stuck in this like fight with their pain, where a lot of what we try to teach people is, is how do we start re-engaging you back into life it was safe ways through a lot of the good things Tom talked about lifestyle, um, stress management, working on our, our psychology part of it, our mind body connection isn't it's a connection in what that we've created. It's they're one in the same. We can't separate the two if you look at what science tells us yet. It's you know been something in, in traditionally medicine where we put them in two separate buckets. Um, so helping people understand that connection and how you can work both together to engage and get yourself moving back into life with pain is, can be can be huge. Um, I, want, I want to make a comment. I think I think what you're saying is is perfect. But I, I think what what's challenging from our perspective and, and when we're trying to deliver this message is. Uh, we don't want people to think that, oh, you just need to deal with the pain and move on. And that's a, that's a weird fine line. I mean, I don't know if you experience this when we're talking with patients, you don't want to be like, well, we want you to manage the pain. Well, also, you just want me to ignore it or you want me to deal with it. No. And it, it is a, a unique approach to trying to learn how to understand the stimuluses that occur to you in life and how to help you manage those stimulus in a much more positive way. And I think that really, just to kind of backtrack just a second, this really gets at this idea of chronic pain uh, often can be uh, your body's reaction to a stimulus 
thinking it's harmful when it's not. And I think that that is a generalized sort of statement. But um, I really want to drive home the point that we are not suggesting that you just need to to deal with it and, and move forward with life, life despite pain. Um, but you need to learn how to work with it. And your body changes, your brain uh, changes in its interpretation of things. And those are true positive effects, not just mere ignoring something uh, necessarily. Yeah, good points. And one other thing I'd add to that is there is unfortunately, and I think some of it came out of the, the new research shown that if we really help teach people about pain, that it can be very helpful. And it is helpful, but a lot of the the discussions then kind of can move towards the brain and the central nervous system and its impact on things. And some of the unfortunate perceptions that have come across from the patient population is, well, you're saying this is all in my head. And we would say absolutely not. All pain has influence from our head. Whether you stub a toe, if you got, if you stub a toe and there's a train running you down, your head's going to decide that train's more important and you're going to move out of the way and your toe might may not hurt so much. Now, if you're, you're, you stub your toe and you're a ballerina who's about to go on a performance, it's probably going to hurt a lot more because that's a lot more threatening to what your situation is um, right now. So, um, yeah, it, it's one of those things that your head always has, whatever we make judgments of the sensory experience from our body, whatever messages our body is sending into the into our nervous system, um, we're going to make judgments on it. So and whether it's an acute pain or chronic pain and with chronic pain, there's just a lot of negative things around x-rays and scans and things that we've pointed to already that give people, as Tom alluded to, they move with a lot of protection and fear and, you know, kind of very um, guarded and they start really limiting their life because of, of some of these things. And then they just snowballs into all these different things that the earlier slides showed that can negatively send people down into that. So no, pain is not all on your head, but it's helpful to understand how our thoughts, our emotions, our, our feelings, our behaviors all impact pain and they can have a, a significant impact on pain. When, our, when we're in high stress, like I said, the haunted house versus the beach, our body behaves differently. And when life unfortunately deals with a lot of chronic pain, it can become a very distressing, depressing, frustrating, anger filled experience, understandably. Um, and that will have impacts on pain and helping to learn about that. And oftentimes we'll lean upon our psychology colleagues. They do a wonderful job helping people unpack some of the things around their challenging experience with pain that they can might work with them on to hopefully move them in a positive direction about it. Yeah, I, I like what you're saying in terms of the collaboration there, especially, you know, how often uh, are we, uh, can an influence of something like depression or anxiety really kind of influence someone's uh, uh, pain and chronic pain situation? I had a, a just the other day, I was talking with a, a client who you know, it is a little challenging sometimes for us. We are not psychologists, right? We are not in behavioral medicine, but we work with people. We work with people dealing with very complex stuff. And we have abilities to recognize where there is challenges in this whole system of pain management. And so when you approach a, a patient who you are concerned with their fear avoidance, you're concerned with their pain catastrophizing mentality, or you're concerned with depression, you know, to make that challenging conversation or, or what may seem challenging on the surface but once you open that door and say hey look i think you would really benefit and, and explain why we want to approach this both from a physical movement perspective and from a top-down perspective maybe emotionally um you can really make a positive change and the response often is wow i didn't consider that or thank you no i haven't done that or they're already on, on their way involved with some sort of behavioral medicine than that so yeah i think uh it's it's really uh, a team approach from that perspective uh, and it's it's just the influences are so complex and intertwined that you need that help yeah i mean we're fortunate we have our family medicine we have some amazing physicians here at midwestern university who can kind of obviously and, and that's definitely somebody you want on your healthcare team that can manage the medical components because there are medical components of chronic pain and it's not to say that medications and things can't be helpful it's just we can't rely on one factor we know this is a i always say we can't focus on one tree to a forest problem we need to work the whole forest and that's where our physical therapist and, and tom alluded to it we also incorporate psychologically informed principles to kind of incorporate some of these discussions so we can complement some of the fine things our folks in psychology are doing to help people better navigate life through with some of the challenging things that chronic pain can can um, have uh, them dealing with. And then also, I mean, we'll work hand in hand sometimes with pain physicians who sometimes can do some procedural work that can help with, with pain. Um, and there's a variety of different health, sometimes rheumatologists, if it's an inflammatory thing, 
<clears throat> there's just a lot of folks that can be part of the team. But I think in the grand scheme of it, I think the main goal becomes let's not wait for pain to go away to a zero or be fixed, because oftentimes that may not be a realistic goal for some people in persistent pain. But let's start getting you back to life and doing things that bring you joy, bring you happiness, start bringing you meaning in your life. And oftentimes we'll see pain secondary decrease when we stop having it. I can't move forward until my pain is a zero out of 10 on that scale. Granted, we will all want pain relief. And I think you can get it if we start reengaging in things that help our body start reengaging and tolerating the things that they're currently sensitive to. That's a hard switch, though, because a lot of times healthcare gets us in this mode of um, we need to be fixed before we can move forward. And that that's the kind of acceptance that Tom alluded to. It's not that you have to just suck it up and deal with it. It's just that maybe we can accept that my pain doesn't have to be a zero for me to move back into things in life that bring me meaning, bring me joy, bring me value and what I want to be able to accomplish from a day to day thing. Tom, I'd love like some of the interventions we do um, from a physical therapy standpoint. Obviously, we won't get too deep into like the the, the medical perspectives of it. But um, what, what are some of the common interventions you will see with uh, folks in physical therapy around persistence? Well, within physical therapy specifically, yeah, I think you know beyond the education and being a part of the whole team there, uh, something that I've spoken of many times while you and I have chatted is this idea of movement therapy. I mean exercise we've said many times we'll say many times again movement good sloth is bad we got to get up moving you got to get the blood flow and all those healthy wonderful endorphins moving um so uh that can be tailored specifically you know through your physical therapist identifying where the weaknesses are or the faults in sort of the system are and building a plan and a program that we're going to try to hopefully make you consistent with i think even more specific than just standard movement and exercise a lot of patients dealing with uh, chronic pain, especially pain that limits their mobility uh, and sort of ability to participate in, in activities that would allow for, for good exercise. Things like aquatic therapy, pretty well known for something like this. It's a safe environment. There's a decrease in that weight bearing stress, uh, like arthritis uh, treatments, you know, that can be respond to that quite well. Um, some other that we see that PTs may be influenced uh, in terms of teaching how to perform things like mindfulness, diaphragmatic breathing. A lot of these help regulate your systems like blood pressure and heart rate and take you away from that haunted house, as you say, and start to try to bring you closer to that beach mentality of managing the body as a whole versus uh, simply just trying to get stronger or get more flexible or whatnot. Um, those are just some of them. I mean, there are very specific ones that if we're dealing with very specific, there's a condition called complex regional pain syndrome, which falls in an umbrella. I don't want to get too deep into it, but you may see as someone out there listening, you may have your therapist bring out a mirror box and have you work uh, in front of a mirror to kind of help uh, uh, change the perceptions of pain and movement within the brain and body. Um, that is supported in a lot of ways for certain conditions. You may see um, something called laterality, which is another kind of a hyper specific one that I won't get too far into, but it's this idea of understanding your lefts versus rights and how the brain interprets, interprets that and how that can change when you're dealing with persistent pain. So um, it can be global movement. It could be all the way down to specific uh, interventions. I'm not sure what other you've seen in your clinic or what you use. Yeah, like the graded motor imagery interventions that you just spoke to, we we definitely use those, especially with some of our complex regional pain things. Um, you know, mindfulness, and again, to I would reiterate the ability to help you modulate some of that distress system, that fight or flight system, that haunted house system. That really, I always give it the it's like the gain setting on like a speaker, like you're cranking it up when you're in those situations, and then also recognizing well what parts of our life might be cranking up the gain setting with all the distressing, frustrating, emotional laden things that people unfortunately have to deal with when they're dealing with chronic pain, working with some of our behavioral med psychology colleagues to manage some of the, the crap, unfortunately, that's come along with these pain situations that people have had to deal with um, because that turns up the gain setting. And then starting to, as physical therapists, what are the things in life you want to get back to? And then we start working with a plan of teaching you about pain, why it's safe, why your tissues are safe to move, even though the what you're feeling will make you feel like nothing is safe to move and you know starting to gain some confidence in moving starting small to what you can start becoming successful with starting just to where we can start building slowly because a lot of people hear exercise and like hey heck no that ain't me that's going to put me in bed for three days and we definitely respect that and and definitely have patients who come in very hesitant to move and 
exercise may not be, you know, it might be just getting a trip out to the mailbox. Maybe it's making a trip out to the garden and doing some, you know, some light things that just make you feel like the, yourself that you wanted to be in the past. And we just start taking piecemeal bits of that to start building you back up again. Um, and we see people that as they start learning more about their pain, as they start regaining confidence in their body, as they start dealing with some of the challenging emotional and psychological things that normal people go through when they've had such a life altering experience that chronic pain can put them in that man, their pain can get significantly better. For some people, it does go away completely. For some people, it doesn't go away, but they're happy because they're back doing things in life that bring them meaning, meaning bring, bring them joy, bring them um, happiness. So, I mean, it's um, that's sometimes the acceptance that, you know, our psychology colleagues and, and we'll talk about, would it be okay if you still had some pain, if it meant you're still, you're back to doing the things that bring you meaning? I think so, a lot of people would be willing to have that trade to be okay. Maybe I don't need to have my 16th injection or my seventh surgery that hasn't quite fixed it yet. Maybe I can put down that fix it approach and maybe the fixing I need to do is to fix my life that's been disrupted so big, uh, hugely around the pain situation I've been experiencing. So Tom, if somebody's looking to, um, you know, engage in, in a, a program or to talk to somebody about how they could maybe get help with their chronic pain, what, what would you recommend they do? Uh, in terms of seeking out some, some treatment? Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, contacting, you know, a, a local physical therapist is a great start. I mean, obviously we are, uh, have quite a few different health professions here at our clinic. Uh, as you mentioned from, from physicians to, uh, uh, speech therapy. You guys have behavioral medicine as well. So I think um, a physical therapist often can serve as a entryway to understanding pain and and maybe uh, getting the ball rolling on that. Your primary care physician is also a wonderful start for that uh, in managing and, and maybe getting a team together. Um, I think that's really kind of what we're trying to stress here is that um, if you're dealing with chronic pain on a significant level, um, it's typically not just going to be simply managed by having a therapist tell you to move or having a uh, psychologist telling you, uh, you know, going through behavioral therapy. But uh, a combination of that is really where people get most of uh, their benefit. There's one really quick thing I would like to say. Uh, I had a wonderful student uh, a couple of years ago in the clinic with me. Shout out to Austin. Um, and anyway, we had a pretty good discussion on pain one time. And at the end of his rotation with me, he gave me, because my kids were little at the time, he gave me a kid's book called uh, There's No Such Thing as a Dragon. And it is, anyone out there listening, if you have kids, and basically, Mark, it explains what you're talking about. When you are stuck with pain in front of you and you ignore sort of anything else, then the problem is going to persist and grow and grow and grow. And once you acknowledge that it exists, then you can start managing it and then it likely will very well shrink from that point. So uh, it's a it's a cute little kid's book, but there is some some underlying chronic pain uh, theme going on there. Anyway, uh, I, I felt the need to plug that as well as the student that brought it to my attention. It's a pretty yeah. neat thing. We, we could have a whole talk on how culturally we've made pain such as dragon in the world. Oh my gosh, like, yes. I, we could. I mean, the pain is really in itself a helpful thing to have. If we don't have pain, Pain is protective. Pain is what teaches us not to put our hands on hot burners, what, not to do stupid things with our bodies. Um, so it can be helpful. It's just when it overstays its welcome and it overstays its utility, that becomes a problem. And I think yeah. getting kids, there's studies of middle schoolers, elementary schoolers learning about pain and having a better understanding and perception of it can really help them navigate it further in the world. There's also a lot of studies that show how mom and dad and how families and all cultures uh, ascribe meaning to pain really translates to the people that live in those cultures and in those families and things. Um, so learning more about pain is a very helpful thing that can help people uh, navigate. And we appreciate all of you who spent some time today um, with us, uh, hopefully learning some things about pain. As Tom said, if you're having any questions, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to Midwestern University. Uh, where our family practice physicians are happy to to talk to you about pain. Your uh, physical therapists here are happy to talk to you and get you on a game plan with pain. Um, we often can help coordinate services to make sure you're getting the best team assembled to tackle your chronic pain issues. So with that, I'll, we're going to leave it at that this month. Hope you enjoyed the stream and we will talk to you all next month. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. See you next month.